Today, I'd like to talk, tell a brief story in four parts, uh, therapy, pandemic, memory, and prevention. But first, of course, a brief introduction to the science, the immune system. We have two immune systems, an innate immune system and an adaptive immune system. The, the innate uh, immune system is the first line of defense against pathogens or germs. It releases signaling molecules that trigger an inflammatory response, and it primes the adaptive immune system. Uh, I'm going to quote uh, here Columbia University physician and author Siddhartha Mukherjee, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his book, Emperor of All Maladies, about cancer, you may recall, because his language is, uh, is colorful. Quote, adaptive immunity involves two principal kinds of cells. B cells make antibodies against pathogens, and T cells hunt for cells infected by a pathogen. B cells can be imagined as sharpshooters that target a virus with well-aimed bullets, that is to say antibodies, while T cells are gumshoe detectives that go door to door seeking viruses that are hidden inside cells. Both, set, uh, both uh, cell types, uh, B cells and T cells, carry the memory of an already encountered pathogen or germ. Uh, these so-called memory cells can trigger, can be tri are triggered when a pathogen reappears and they can swiftly raise forces to fight it. I raise the question, might these memory cells remember today's novel coronavirus infections a century from, from now in survivors? I, I suggest the answer is yes, and more on that soon. Uh, what are antibodies? Antibodies are the Y-shaped molecules whose tips can attach Velcro-like onto specific viruses or bacteria or parasites. They are biomarkers of infection, and if sustained, can confer long-term immunity. We have, eight, we have billions of B cells that, that can produce 10 to 20 million distinct types of, of antibodies. In all, we have the ability to generate one quintillion, that's one with 18 zeros behind it, antibodies, which gives us the ability to neutralize a vast number of pathogens or germs with protective neutralizing antibodies. And here you see the, it illustrated the, uh, the Y-shaped antibodies attaching to the spike protein of the coronavirus and uh, by attaching, preventing the virus from uh, attaching to the, the uh, human cell receptor. In this case, the ACE2 receptor in uh, uh, highly expressed in, in uh, lung epithelial cells, airway, uh, in the airway, but also in other tissues and organs. Uh, and this is the entry point. Uh, for the coronavirus, the virus attaches to the uh, receptor, goes to various conformational changes and enters the cell uh, and then releasing its RNA into the cell and essentially commandeering the cell to do its bidding and, rather, and, you know, and putting the cell's own interests aside. All right, uh, I'm gonna suggest three never befores here and I'm happy to be challenged on this. Uh, these are simply propositions. Never before have vaccinated human bodies created so many antibodies in a shorter time in, his, in history of vaccination. 600 million doses of influenza virus are made annually. We're gonna have billions of uh, novel coronavirus vaccines, doses. Never before in the history of medicine has a virus been under greater research scrutiny in such a short time. And never before has the well-being of the world economy hinged so much on a biomolecular binding event. In this case, how tightly the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus binds to the ACE2 protein receptor in human lung and airway epithelial cells. Uh, because binding affinity correlates with transmission. All, all of the new major variants uh, uh, have a mutation uh, called uh, E484K that allows the variants to bind tighter to the ACE2 receptor before enhancing transmission. Uh, the novel coronavirus ACE2 receptor binding event has added an estimated $24 trillion to global debt over the past year. This, uh, this uh, event uh, last May was quite interesting. It brought together sci uh, biomedical science and finance uh, at the highest level. Uh, the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis hosted uh, a, the, the panel. Uh, the keynote was given by Mr. Jeffrey, Mr. Jeremy Farrar, our trust in uh, gave a home, uh, op gave opening remarks. A former FDA commissioner was, was one of the panelists, as was a former CDC director. And Lawrence Summers, the, the uh, professor emeritus of uh, 
economics at Harvard and a former U.S. Treasury secretary, he said in this uh, in this uh, hour long discussion, a vaccine breakthrough or therapy or therapy breakthrough is worth it at any imaginable imaginable price. In rough numbers, this is costing the American economy eighty billion dollars a week. Again, this is last May. Uh, he he and his co- and colleague, uh, Harvard economist David Cutler, health economist, uh, uh, suggested uh, in a paper last fall that from March twenty twenty to to uh, the October twenty twenty one, we could expect to spend sixteen trillion dollars. That's the first eighteen months. Uh, uh, half of it uh, in uh, lost output and the other half in healthcare costs and other associated costs. Bear in mind the floods, wildfires, droughts, hurricanes, polar storms, et cetera, are measured in billions of dollars. So an order of magnitude practically smaller. Uh, America spent $4.8 trillion in today's dollars fighting World War II. Over the past year, America spent over $5.5 trillion fighting the pandemic. Last month, uh, in a New England Journal of Medicine podcast, Sir Jeremy Farrar, director of the Wellcome Trust, said, when you look at the SARS-CoV-2 virus, it would seem from structural biology mapping studies that the virus still has quite a long way to evolve, potentially. The affinity between the virus and its human receptor, the ACE2 receptor, is not optimized as well as it potentially could be. You could increase the affinity of that binding site more than the current mutations have given it, unquote. So now we're going to, to talk, this is the first part of my four-part uh, uh, story, therapy, antibodies enter the practice of medicine. This story uh, the, uh, of Henry Welcome, I, public, I wrote in the early 1990s. I put it up on the web in 1995. Uh, I, I was never able to get it published, but it seems uh, more relevant all the time, uh, especially uh, given the, the, the pandemic. Henry Walker's first of his many uh, humanitarian deeds was to manufacture diphtheria antitoxin and distribute it at below cost. For the first time, the strangling angel of children could be treated. Uh, let's travel briefly with, uh, with uh, the long view, beginning with Welcome's birth in a log cabin in Wisconsin to his boyhood canoeing on the Watanwan River that flows through Garden City, south of Mankato in the 1860s, to working in his father's drugstore and hanging out with his physician uncle, to being his uncle's friend's William Worrell Mayo's tutorial student in chemistry in Rochester, to graduating from the Philadelphia School of Pharmacy, the nation's best in 1874, to the founding with fellow student Silas Burroughs, uh, the Burrow of uh, the Burroughs Welcome Company in London in 1880, to laying the research, a research foundation for the drug making industry, to building tropical medicine research and care facilities in Africa, to canoeing on the Thames River in London, to amassing vast collections of medical books and antiquities, to sending his medicine ch- kits and branded drugs with the great polar explorers, with Teddy Roosevelt out west, with Charles Lindbergh in his cockpit, and after his death, to the moon with the Apollo 12 astronauts, to leading all his company's stock to charity upon his death in 1936. The Welcome Trust now has $42 billion in assets and it distributes one to two billion in annual research funding every year, making it the sixth largest founder of health research in the world. And as I thought this over today, it's just as if Welcome Spirit is out there canoeing on the River Cam in Cambridge, UK. How so? Well, the Cambridge University affiliated Welcome Sanger Institute has sequenced more novel coronavirus genomes than any other single or research organization in the world. And of course, sequencing the virus is critical for tracking uh, viral variants and identifying any possible, quote, vaccine escape mutants, unquote, that might emerge. Diphtheria antitoxin, developed in the late 19th century, the, the, the antitreatment for diphtheria that welcome manufactured and distributed was pioneered in 1890 by the German physiologist Emil von Behring, the savior of children, together with Japanese physician and bacteriologist Shibasaburo, Shibasaburo, Kitasato, Kitasato, sorry. Uh, their breakthrough research represents of science of biology, the organized study of the immune system. Von Behring was awarded the very first Nobel Prize in Physiology of Medicine in 1901 for his work. Uh, today, the CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, stockpiles horse plasma derived diphtheria antitoxin. The, the CDC uh, supplies made in Brazil 
as the U.S. has no domestic manufacturers. Uh, and they are, scientists are working an alternative. Uh, this is, <laughs> this uh, therapy has remained largely the same uh, uh, for all these years. And yet we have technologies now that we should, the horses are not, uh, are not uh, are harmed, but even so it's time to move on from horses. Uh, I think most of us would agree. Okay. Uh, the next part of our story, pandemic. Uh, as a side note, uh, last year, 2020, was the deadliest year in recorded U.S. history, according to new figures from the CDC. The 15% increase in the American death rate is the largest since 1918 with the outbreak uh, of the pandemic flu. By the time the influence of the influenza pandemic ended in April uh, 1920, it had taken the lives of some, some 675,000 Americans. In the upper Midwest, the influenza uh, launched its de deadly rampage at the Great Lakes Naval Station, uh, just, just outside Chicago, in September 1918. A month later, the Chicago Tribune, as you see here, reported that the Illinois Influenza Advisory Commission was roused to high enthusiasm by a therapeutic breakthrough. And I'm quoting now, in a word, the treatment consists of injection of a serum extracted from the blood of persons who have recovered from the influenza pneumonia. And again, that's, that's, that's of course convalescent plasma. The uh, commission said it would try to secure a supply of the precious serum for local cases, uh, of, uh, for use in cases of severe illness uh, by drawing on the graces of the donor volunteers among the Jackies, that is to say the sailors at the Great Lakes Naval Station and the sol soldiers at nearby Camp Grant, which is another infection hotspot. Uh, and it stressed that the serum is absolutely different article from the vaccine, which is to be manufactured in the commission's direction after the method of Dr. E. C. Rosenau of the Mayo Foundation. That's in, the, in, the, in this newspaper account. Uh, the um, vaccine is a preventative, is an administered to persons who are well. The serum is a cure. And they use the term cure here, of course, inaccurately. And is administered to sick persons. By the way, E. C. Rosenau was one of... Mayo's great medical minds in the first half of the 20th century. Of course, the blood plasma of the influenza survivor, influenza survivors were not at all a cure, it was a treatment. Uh, but in 20, 2006, a meta-analysis of clinical studies performed at that time, that is say 1918, 1919, uh, uh, suggests that neutralizing uh, counterattack by the plasma's antibodies uh, may have led to, quote, a clinically important reduction in the risk of death. Now, convalescent plasma is back uh, in the COVID-19 era. It is a type of passive immunity, which is a long history uh, against viral and bacterial diseases. Again, is the standard of care in, the, in treating diphtheria. Uh, today, antibodies and transfused convalescent plasma from individuals have received, who have recovered from the infection in patients uh, is used in patients uh, with COVID-19 disease. Last spring, the Mayo Clinic's Michael Joyner headed up a federally funded FDA expanded access program to, uh, set up to coordinate the collection and distribution of COVID-19 convalescent plasma across the country. And more than 100,000 patients signed up for the, pro for the program. And then in August, you may recall, the FDA granted convalescent plasma emergency use, uh, use authorization. And last month, it limited the EUA to treating patients uh, soon after diagnosis with high titers, high, high amounts of uh, convalescent plasma. Uh, I, uh, Dr. Cohen will talk more about this. I hope you'll have some questions along these lines. Hundreds of thousands of uh, COVID-19 patients have been treated, but the jury is still out on whether it really works. How did the, how did outbreak occur in, uh, in uh, Minnesota? Uh, it occurred in Faribault County, actually my county. I'm from Blue Earth, you can see down there in the lower left. Uh, on September 18th, 1918, when army musician, a private Raymond Paulson stepped off the train in his hometown of Wells in Faribault County, he wasn't feeling all that great, but he didn't give it much thought. Soon after getting to his parents' house, a telegram came from the Navy. The telegram said Raymond's 22 year old brother, Walter, had died from a strange pneumonia and his body was shipped for us, which would soon be shipped. The day after Walter's funeral, Raymond died, and the day after that, his sister died, as did in time the pastor who conducted Raymond's funeral. The uh, infection spread to the other communities, Blue Earth, Winnebago, um, largely via the railroad. 
by the time it was over, a thousand people had died, uh, more than a thousand in Faribault County, more than 10,000 in Minnesota. Uh, the, uh, there was an article published in 2007, uh, uh, co-authored by Ruth Linfield, who's the state epidemiologist here. Uh, and uh, it, it, uh, it is astounding to see how, how, how you, you, as much as you'd like to prevent chaos uh, uh, in terms of messaging, in terms of practice and policy, it's very difficult to do. Minneapolis and St. Paul went sort of different directions in many respects, uh, with re with respect to uh, uh, to uh, you know the ga gathering in public places, how many people in the streetcar, whether you could ride the elevators, uh, the schools uh, opening and closing, uh, and, and on and on, um, and and they I think they were simply conducting an experiment uh, and looking at each other. The case fatality rate in Minneapolis was five. The case fatality rate in St. Paul was 15. Uh, so the, uh, when, when you have a pandemic, you're going to have, even, even with the best planning, you're going to have some chaos. Uh, the article uh, starts off with a famous uh, quote from George Santayana, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And then I'm, uh, after reading the article, I was... Uh, I'm reminded of the, uh, the famous uh, uh, quote from Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun. The third part of the four part, uh, uh, my four part story is memory. How long does memory last? In, uh, in 20, 2004, Eric Altshuler, a medical resident, was watching television, uh, the show, a television show one night while he was on call. It was a slow night, as he put it. The show was a short-lived TV series called Medical Investigation and featured fi fictional uh, um, scientists who tracked down causes of mysterious diseases. Uh, in this particular episode, Mutation, uh, a team of NIH scientists flies to a small Virginia town to figure out why people are dying uh, from a deadly strain uh, of a uh, flu. Through contact tracing, we've heard that term recently, of course, and asking questions, they find that the deadly flu spares an elderly butler who had survived the 1918 flu pandemic as a toddler. Uh, anyway, uh, they, um, they, they fly the butler to the NIH uh, and, and uh, draw his blood, prepare convalescent plasma with his antibodies against the H1N1 influenza virus from his blood, return to the scene and give the infected people the butler's convalescent plasma just in time to save their lives. Uh, however, there's not enough convalescent plasma to go around, so rationing is implemented. And of course, you remember the term rationing in the context of ventilators last spring. Anyway, uh, all Schuler wondered, might the immune, uh, immune system memory still be present in the elderly survivors of the 1918 influenza pandemic? And so he approached the NIH. Marcel Proust, uh, Remembrance of Things Press, uh, uh, Remembrance of Things past. There's no artist uh, 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 who's more associated with memory than Marcel Proust. He published his uh, 1.5 million word, seven volume masterpiece, Remembrance of Things Past, or more recently translated as In Search of Lost Time, uh, from 1913 to 1922. The English writer Graham Greene uh, called Proust the greatest novelist of the 20th century. And he's remembered uh, if, 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 uh, for, if you, those who, who have not uh, made their way through the seven divines, he's remembered, for, rem remembered mostly for two things. The Madeline Cakes, it, he takes a bite of, Madeline, of a Madeline cake in Swan's Way, the first volume, and suddenly the memory returns from the vast structure of recollection. So the memory, uh, uh, the, ma the uh, Madeline cake uh, 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 brings, brings forth a flood of uh, mem childhood memories that, that he that he writes that he writes about uh, in in amazing detail, uh, and that's called involuntary memory. The second thing that he's remembered for is his cork-lined bedroom. As an adult, he spent most of his adulthood in bed, in the bedroom, cork-lined bedroom, because he was an asthmatic. He was a, he was a hypersensitive to any environmental assault, uh, and he. he he would uh, sleep during the day because there's a lot of commotion outside. At night, he'd sit up in bed, draw his legs up, put a platform on his on his legs, and write. And he'd write all night. Uh, he was the, as had been described, the original master 
of social distancing, perhaps not so surprising because his father was the French epidemiologist and hygienist Adrian Proust, who himself pioneered concepts of quarantine, cordon sanitaire containment, and social distancing, described as the man who wanted to confine everyone. Adrian Proust was dubbed the geographer of epidemics uh, based on his travels uh, tracking epidemic, epidemics abroad. Uh, in, in December uh, 1918, uh, the flu was there in, uh, in uh, France, and Proust wrote to the editor of Nouvelle Revue Française, Dear Madam, I would be pleased to know if you and your son and your loved ones, as well as everyone in the review, escaped the flu. Okay, the question is, where does the memory of 1918, 1918 influenza pandemic reside in today's survivors? Well, in the brains of some uh, who can recall, those few who are alive and can recall, and in their memory B cells, and perhaps of perhaps all uh, people who were exposed to it who are still alive. And so in, in uh, 2008, a study led by Vanderbilt University, investigators, including Altshuler, studied 32 pandemic survivors ages 91 to 101 for biological memory of the influenza pandemic to which they had been exposed. And there were, there were controls. There were, they also studied people who, who were born after the pandemic. They wanted to de determine if the survivors still had antibodies to the virus and to see if the B cells that produced the antibody could, could be cultured and induced to make antibodies uh, to the key 1918 virus protein. They concluded, these studies demonstrate that survivors of the 1918 influenza pandemic possess highly functional virus neutralizing antibodies to this uniquely virulent virus and that the human and that humans can sustain circulating memory B cells to viruses for many decades after exposure well into the 10th decade of life. So when I would raise the issue in a century from now, those still alive who've been exposed to coronavirus, will they have the memory? Well, their B cells will probably based on this study. Uh, and it's not just B cells that have memory, uh, T cells have memory as well. Uh, and in fact, uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee, I mentioned earlier, uh, just published a piece in the New Yorker magazine. Uh, why does the pandemic seem to be hitting some countries hard? Uh, uh, subtitled, while the virus has ravaged rich nations like the US, report death rates in poorer ones remain relatively low. What probing this, uh, this uh, epidemiological mystery can tell us. And he suggests, based on uh, the comments of some scientists, that the, actually the T cells uh, in people uh, in these countries may have been exposed to, not to the, uh, well, previously been exposed to other types of coronavirus that, do, that produce only mild symptoms. There are three or four of them. Uh, and they may be more pr uh, prevalent in some of these countries. And they had, therefore, with exposure to these other uh, uh, coronaviruses, uh, they have built up some cross-reactive uh, immunity, and maybe that's the reason, again, uh, with the T-cell, memory T-cells coming into play. Okay, and uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the final section of my uh, talk about, pre uh, in this case, about prevention, uh, the pandemic uh, influenza vaccine conundrum. Uh, in, the, in the Twin Cities in 1918, 19, uh, there were, there were um, two different vaccines, neither of them effective uh, because they were neither was informed by, by uh, influenza virus. They were informed by bacteriology. <clears throat> One was made by the University of Minnesota, a University of Minnesota back, bacteriologist was purported to prevent pneumonia. The Mayo Clinic made another vaccine that was intended to prevent both pneumonia and influenza. These uh, vaccines were premised on Pfeiffer's bacillus, uh, a bacteria first described in 1892 by the German physician and bacteriologist Richard Pfeiffer during an influenza pandemic. He saw these rod-shaped bacteria uh, and uh, associated uh, with these, with these uh, uh, infected patients and, uh, and made the assumption uh, or the hypothesis that these bacteria were in fact causative. Uh, so Pfeiffer's bacteria bacillus was argued by some to be the cause of influenza until 1933 when the viral nature of influenza was firmly established. And in fact, as bacteria influenza, not known as influenza, the bacterium is responsible for a wide range of localized and invasive infections. Anyway, the, the, uh, the, uh, the vaccines, bacterial-based 
uh, vaccines were widely distributed in the Twin Cities. Military personnel as well as civilians were inoculated beginning as early as October 1918. Both city health, health departments purchased vaccine and distributed to physicians at no charge to encourage widespread use. And this is again from the, uh, the, the, uh, art, the 2007 article of which Ruth Linfield State Epidemiologist was one of the co-authors. Uh, um, in Minneapolis, people desiring the vaccine thronged to the offices of doctors hoping to be vaccinated. And in St. Paul, it was reported that, quote, thousands of persons have been inoculated, unquote. <clears throat> so that's uh, uh, the, uh, the conundrum dimension here is that these were, you know, it, it, this is a bacterial, uh, antibacterial based uh, um, vaccine, purported vaccine. But in fact, uh, you may have heard that the, uh, uh, for those who died in the 1918 uh, influenza pandemic often died of, ba of uh, bacterial pneumonia following viral infection. Uh, and this, the question is, might these va vaccines based in, uh, on bacteria, might they have been useful in, in, uh, in treating uh, those, those uh, who, who develop bacterial infection uh, following viral assault? And the an we don't know the answer, but there is the, there is a the suggestion in the scientific community. In fact, this might have been a good a good thing to do. All right. Now we're now we're in a, in a we're in the we're in the midst of a revolution here, and you uh, undoubtedly know about the uh, the revolution in mr uh, mRNA vaccine technology. That's uh, it. Just it is astounding. I've been working in the medical school since 1983, and I've seen quite a lot of, uh, of innovation. I've never seen anything quite like this, though. And I'll give you a time frame here. January 10th, the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus sequence is reported uh, to, to the World Health Organization by a Chinese scientist. 30,000 uh, base pairs and 26 genes. By the way, we have 3.2 billion base pairs, we humans, and 20, some 20,000 genes. Okay, that's January 10th. Five days later, the NIH designs mRNA vaccine in collaboration with Moderna. March 16th, two months later, Moderna human trials begin. November 16th, eight months later, Moderna reports phase three human trial results, eight months. And then the next month, December 18th, Moderna vaccine receives FDA emergency use authorization. And of course the Pfizer BioNTech uh, vaccine, uh, MR, mRNA vaccine uh, uh, was actually, actually preceded, was actually approved earlier a bit earlier, it's in, but it's the same, essentially the same story. Uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, 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 wrote about this, uh, this new platform and uh, I'm quoting now, researchers in gene-based technology produced a class of vaccines they believe can protect against all manner of outbreaks in the years to come. So we'll see about that. Okay, if I'm wrapping up now, ecology and health. <clears throat> uh, again, Sir Jeremy Farrar, uh, just last month. The pandemic is the end result of drivers, but they're going to remain, in my view, through the 21st century. They are changing ecology, changing ecology, changing land use, changing interactions between humans and animals, and then humans living in, in huge cities densely populated, highly connected with both the country and globally. Uh, my virtual background, you notice that this, 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 this is my virtual background, is Cedar Bog Lake at the U of M uh, Cedar Creek uh, Ecosystem Science Reserve in East Bethel, where graduate student Raymond Lindemann did his pioneering ecosystems ecology work, uh, field work in the 1930s. And I recent, recently wrote a book chapter about Lindemann entitled Raymond Lindemann, Minnesota Bog Lake and the Birth of Ecosystems Ecology. The, the term ecosystem had just been coined when Lindemann began his field work on Cedar Bog Lake. Uh, but Lindemann gave the term a firm scientific foundation, published a very famous paper in 1942. And as the Wellcome Trust, Sir Jeremy Farrar, frames it here, uh, frames it here, uh, ecosystems have everything to do with pandemics. Uh, in our, uh, in our uh, 2014 book, The Biologist's Imagination, Innovation in the Biosciences, Leo Furt and I published that. Uh, we use this epigraph. The ability of human societies to modify and transform systems will increase more in this century than it has in a hundred centuries since the dawn of agriculture. That's from the journal Nature. And, and I pose the question here to you all. 
What about the ability uh, of biological systems and ecosystems of which pandemic viruses are part to transform us? Pandemics uh, change societies. The current pandemic will change us in ways we cannot now imagine. The long view from the river will express how we see ourselves after we emerge, how we illuminate the journey through and beyond the pandemic in imaginative and creative ways. As Marcel Proust once wrote, time is preserved in memory and memory is preserved in art. And some words of wisdom here from Chief Seattle. I'll stop there and uh, ask for Claudia to come on board and please do uh, send us some questions. I have a question. Yes. Doesn't this um, call call in, in, into um, prominence the the uh, importance of history and in uh, the remembrance of, like you said, the remembrance of things past, um, knowing what worked in the past and not having to call up, uh, not having to re redo everything all over again every time. Of course, that's a, you know, it's going to be interesting. Uh, this, this will change us in some ways, whether it will change us in ways that, that prepare us for another, God forbid, experience like this. It's really hard to say. Uh, the, um, the notion that these are 100-year pandemics, I think we could put aside. Uh, the, uh, just based on the uh, forces at work, bringing us into context, uh, contact with, uh, with uh, zoonotic uh, uh, diseases, what they call zoonotic diseases, uh, and, and uh, the, 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 pro the proximity we have with, a with animals who may be reservoirs, such as the horseshoe bat in China. The horseshoe bat, according to some experts, uh, has an untold number of coronaviruses that, that circulate in its system. Where, as one put it, we're in B in the alphabet when it comes to coronavirus and horseshoe bats. Now, most of them are going, are going to be mild, probably, and not, not serious to humans, but you never know. And of course, we don't know now with the current coronavirus. We don't know, uh, although we, we're getting, given some reassurance, I follow this, that we won't find, a, a, there won't be a mutation as deadly as, let's say, that would produce uh, 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 levels of, uh, of, um, of um, death, uh, severe sickness and death that the 1918 um, influenza pandemic produced. And of course, if you, if you develop, if, if the virus uh, develops in ways that allow for tighter molecular binding, that in, will enhance its transmission. And over time, of course, greater transmission means more, more sickness and death uh, in the long haul. But of course, the vaccines are, are coming on. And the idea is that the, right now, the vaccines, I mean, you may have heard about this, I'm getting off a richest uh, point a bit. The vaccines uh, uh, look to be effective against the, the mutants that are out there, uh, or, or, and the antibody production may be slightly diminished. But don't forget uh, the T cell memory uh, is is uh, critical for protection as well, not just the antibodies. And there hasn't been a lot uh, uh, published or discussed about uh, about T cell uh, uh, protection uh, following vaccination uh, uh, or natural infection. I have a question. Yes. Yes. Um, this is regarding T cell memory. Yes. Okay. So I'm a retired pediatrician and I was exposed to coronaviruses every day for over 25 years. And I've been wondering from what your comment about um, other nations where they may have had more exposures, if any studies have been done, um, uh, because it's the, it's the only adult population that's been exposed to coronaviruses on a daily basis for many years. Any studies have been done on how many pediatricians have gotten coronavirus or their T cell. That's a, that's a fascinating. Yeah, it, it's a fascinating question, and uh, and it, it, my guess is, and you know, the thinking back to this, the, uh, the the TV program that Eric Altschuler was watching, I would think that this is going to have to be pursued. Uh, I don't know the studies are underway, uh, but Dr. Cohen may uh, know something about that. Uh, are you there, Claudia? Yeah. Okay, it is. It is a. It's a great question. I've not read of any studies that specifically target 
the pediatrician population or other populations that would be at at, at a higher risk of exposure to um, related coronaviruses. Um, I know that there are basic science studies and of how exposure to certain viruses in the past can actually promote a negative response in people. Um, the, the classic one is if you've been exposed to dengue virus and then you um, are exposed to Zika, that you have a much worse response to Zika than people who have not been exposed to dengue. And there are people who think that this idea of antibody dependent enhancement will occur due to past exposures to coronavirus, but it's not been shown on a population basis or in a lab yet. So no, I think it's a really good question, but I don't know the answer. Okay. Uh, we have another question um, from Bob that says that you seem to say that the world would be flooded with billions of doses of vaccine. Is that correct? Uh, well, uh, I can mm -hmm. say that based, based on what I've seen, uh, uh, that the Pfizer and, and Moderna, J&J, &J, AstraZeneca, Novavax coming on, uh, we are talking about billions of doses uh, in a short time. The, uh, after all, the first uh, doses were outside of clinical trials, and uh, once approved, were just last, late last year. Uh, and so if you, if you go from late last year to late this year, I, I am sure that we are going to be talking about Billions of doses um, uh, made uh, manufactured. How many administered? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, the uh, again, the the uh, annual manufacturing of influenza is six hundred thousand. Excuse me, six hundred million uh, doses, of which a fraction of you is about fifty percent are actually administered. Uh, but six hundred thousand. Excuse me, six hundred million doses versus billions for for a coronavirus. I think I think that's that's a reasonable. Um, estimate. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, how soon do you expect booster vaccines to be required? Uh, I'm sorry, oh, beg pardon? How soon do you expect booster vaccines to oh, be required? Uh, this, well, uh, the uh, CEO of Pfizer says it, uh, a booster can be, can be produced in about three months. That's, uh, that was a a comment he made a, a, a short while ago. Uh, they are working on that right now, as I understand it. Uh, and so, so presum presumably, uh, maybe it was a month ago that he said that. I'm guessing that they they are they will have a booster capability in a fairly short time, but I don't actually know. And the t and the uh, thought is that come fall, uh, some of the authorities think that boosters will be necessary, uh, and uh, or at least handy. Uh, uh, and uh, there should be no problem. Uh, the, the, uh, vaccine, the vaccine manufacturers is ramping up very quickly. And uh, uh, even though we may not have everything we want in March, there's, they're talking April and May as being abundant, uh, even potentially oversupply uh, of, vac of vaccine. Now we're talking about the advanced, uh, we're talking about advanced economies, uh, the richer nations. Uh, the biggest challenge, of course, is to make these vac these uh, vac the vaccines available to developing nations, because we're we really are in something like this all in it together. I mean, if you've got if you've got widespread transmission somewhere, uh, it's going to you know uh, uh, dangerous mutants are going to find their way out uh, and 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 uh, and in in our presence. So. Um, do you think you'll it will be necessary to have annual vaccines? That's something I can't answer, uh, but I have heard that, and I have my uh, right is from endemics and endemic like experience. Uh, and others, you know, people who are in a position to know uh, have have said the same thing that this is a possibility. It would be an endemic situation, a controllable, manageable uh, virus. Uh, we're not there. Uh, it is not the flu, uh, but but the but the possibility of it becoming uh, ma manageable with vaccinations and and the boosters uh, is uh, I think on potentially on the horizon. Yes. Um, do you see an increased interest in producing vac vaccines and drugs in the U.S. rather than abroad as a national security issue? 
Well, that's a very good question. And, and it's, you know, uh, the national security world struggles with biology in some, in some respects. Uh, it doesn't seem quite like it wants to, de- I mean, they, they, uh, don't get me wrong, there are agencies within the government and the military that are, uh, that are uh, looking at uh, biology very closely. In, uh, in our book, The Stem Cell Dilemma, published in 2008 and second edition 2011, we have a chapter uh, uh, on, uh, on DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which brought us uh, the GPS, brought us the internet, uh, brought us predator drones and so on, getting into biology and in fact developing uh, a, uh, a, a tabletop rapid vaccine assay system based on human cells. So that you could put the, you could put test a vaccine on the, uh, in the machine rather than in human trials uh, in order to do it in a rapid way in case there, is, in case there was a biological weapon, uh, uh, you know, uh, developed. So, uh, so the answer is uh, that, that uh, national security has to take this uh, more seriously. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the authorities will, will, will say that you, that you can't just uh, think that you, that you protect people in advanced uh, countries and, and that you're going to be okay. Pandemic is, uh, it is a collective, uh, it is a collective all the way through. Uh, and, and the reason that, uh, that New Zealand, one of the, they're talking about that now, there was an article in the paper, the reason New Zealand has such low, such a, you know, it has such a positive experience with this awful, uh, pandemic compared to us is maybe in part that they have they, they've been adopted the New Zealanders the uh, Maori ethos of the collective, especially during times of stress. That the, that the collective is the key, not the not the individual. We have a somewhat different way of looking at it, and we're paying the price. Um, a comment from Rich McKay is um, not just the vaccine supply chain, but all aspects of the U.S. supply chain has been exposed during the epidemic. Note the difficulty of procuring PPE and right. the national security flaw of just in time supply chain has been exposed. Right. And Mike Osterholm of the U of M has uh, been talking about this for, well, certainly during the whole period of the pandemic, especially early on. And his 2017 book addresses this, you know, how can we allow the supply chain not, you know, to, 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 uh, to to when you know to be to move beyond our control uh, and our ability to influence and so uh, any number of key pieces of equipment or 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 uh, or the found foundation agents uh, for drugs etc are not made in the U S uh, they are made overseas uh, and uh, this is all going to have to change and it's going to be it's going to be quite a dramatic I think at least in the short term who knows about 20 years from now, uh, but in the short term, there's going to be major uh, change uh, uh, that deals not only with uh, supply chain issues, but with the, if you know, the whole vaccine world up until this experience of nobody wanted to go there because this vaccine is sort of one and done and nobody can make any money. Well, this is going to be a, a, a now a massive governmental uh, 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 effort. Uh, collaborative effort with private industry and funded by the taxpayer so that we can't, we don't run into this uh, again, uh, at least in, in the near future. Um, a question. Some people who have gotten mild cases of COVID have gone on to develop long haul symptoms. Yes. A small number of vaccinated persons can be expected to develop mild, mild cases of COVID from subsequent exposure. Yes. Is there any data yet to indicate whether vaccinated persons who later contract COVID are or are not at risk to develop long haul symptoms? I don't know the specific answer to that, but I can say that I just read a story about how, how vaccinated uh, long haul patients uh, have improved symptoms. Okay. They're, they're, they're you know, a long haul is going to have a, a whole uh, array of health problems associated with it, many different organs involved, uh, and and uh, I just did read a story that uh, that um, those who who've been vaccinated, uh, those long haulers who've been vaccinated, are, are having a, a significantly reduced symptoms compared to to those who are not. So I could say that uh, just, uh, it would be worth looking into. I can't answer the the question more 
specifically than that. Uh, but, but the long hauler, that's what we, you know, we've only had this for a year now. So, so, uh, you know, so we know long, we know the long hauler experience for one year, but we don't know it for 10 years. And, and, uh, the, uh, and I mentioned Summers and Cutler's article <clears throat> on the $16 trillion cost over 18 months. They're figuring uh, chronic disease. Uh, they're taking into account the cost of chronic disease, and it could be much bigger than maybe even they, they are estimating. Okay. Um, after two Moderna or Pfizer vaccines, how likely is it that one develop COVID-19? I don't know. After vaccination? Yes. I, I don't know the answer to that. I can tell you that the... Uh, that all the vaccines seem to be almost uh, 100% or close uh, in, in, in prevent, not preventing infection, but in preventing serious disease, hospitalization and death. So, oh. the, so, so, so these vaccines uh, may not prevent infection in everyone, but, they, but their, their ability to keep you out of the hospital is just remarkable. Uh, and that's, of course, what we are really interested in. But. Paul Scanlon commented, he said, thanks, Bill. After Moderna or Pfizer, risk of mild COVID-19 is 5%. Risk they, of severe COVID-19 yeah. is near zero. Yeah, they are. That's it. We'll go with Dr. Scanlon there. <laughs> uh, but I knew, it was, I knew it was very high. And, of course, that's, you know, uh, the idea here is to uh, protect everyone against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. If we have to put up with a little flu, of course, we have to, you may have to do that even with the vaccination, some side effects. Uh, that's a, you know, that we, 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 can, we can survive some, some time of th that kind of discomfort. It's the, uh, it's the complete breakdown of the, uh, of the respiratory system and et cetera, that, and the, the, the long hauler uh, uh, complexities <clears throat> we, we, we want to avoid. So, so there, there is no experience uh, uh, in the vaccination, in the history of vaccination, like the one we've had, uh, to, have, to have these uh, safe and effective vaccines produced in such a short time. And they, uh, again, the mRNA platform is going to be implemented for not only for dealing with future viral infections, but for, for uh, the whole, a whole range of uh, what, what used to be pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, this, this, it'll be gene-based uh, therapies for many things. Um, Paul Scanlon also commented that today's trib has an article about long hauler syndrome. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, it, 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 it's just a, a judgment I have that it is that the costs associated with that certainly the, pay, the costs of patients and their families, uh, but the monetary costs are uh, we have not yet begun to appreciate, uh, you know, how significant that is. And in terms, also in terms of work, of uh, workforce participation, for example. So that's an economic uh, issue right there. So you want to uh, uh, get back, to get these vaccines out there uh, and get them, you know, uh, I've had my first, I got this, uh, my second at the end of the month uh, and I'm more comfortable now. I've got, I've got, you know, I'm two weeks out. I've got some antibodies going there. And, uh, and in theory, at least I'm, you know, I probably won't end up in a ventilator if something does bad, if bad does happen. So I hope. Anyway, so. <clears throat> um, does anyone have any other questions or Dr. Cohn, do you have anything else that you would like to add? Um, my, uh, my, my angle on, on COVID has largely been from uh, about convalescent plasma. And I've been following with great interest all the confusing studies that have come out. Um, the jury is still out, as, as Bill already noted, about whether convalescent plasma is helpful, although it is my interpretation of the data that if you, are, if you have developed symptoms of COVID and managed to get convalescent plasma within the first three to five days, really the first three days after symptoms develop, that you will receive benefit from the convalescent plasma. That that is, um, the data are strong for that. Um, otherwise, if you're in the hospital and quite sick and receive it, probably no benefit. Yeah. 
So earlier is better. But that's um that's my only comment. Thank you for this wonderful talk, Bill. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for um, joining me, Claudia. Bye bye. What, one more one more um, comment from Rich McKay. In 1918 epidemic, was there opposition to masks and preventative uh, yes. and preventive measures? Yes. There was, and that includes in the Twin Cities, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, so the mask, uh, the, the great mask debate uh, did occur back then too. Uh, and the, the, there were mandates and there were, and there were depending where you were, the masks were gauze masks those days, not N N95s. They were gauze. And I don't know, uh, but I'm quite sure that gauze masks provide marginal protection, not great. Uh, but but you but if you see the photos of the of the uh, 1918 pandemic, they you know people wearing masks, but their masks are pretty uh, they're 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 pretty poor quality for protecting against uh, uh, against uh, H1 N1 uh, influenza the transmission. Uh, the uh, the uh, N95s, of course, are uh, very good, uh, not perfect, but very good. And then then you not everybody has those. Now we had we we manage with the masks we we have. So, okay. Any other questions from anyone? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Bill, and thank you so much, Dr. Cohn, and everybody for joining us. This was fascinating and informative, and I think we're all a little bit um, in better place as far as knowing about. Um, COVID and about the history. Um, and it was a pleasure um, to hear your comments and um, to learn all about this. Um, we have a several thank yous on the chat. I don't know if you wanna, if you can take a look, Bill. Um, I will. Thank you. Uh, but other than that, and the, the slides were wonderful. Um, so thank you everybody for, for participating and um, it was fascinating. Thank Thanks you. so much.